economies. And contrary to the widespread perception that immigrants lower wages and displace natives, the evidence is actually quite limited on this. And this is because there are many ways by which native workers, but also firms, might react to immigration. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to two important margins of adjustment. The first one is changes in occupational choice by which natives might specialize in tasks in which they have a relative advantage with respect to immigrants. And another margin of adjustment, in particular by firms, is increases in entry of new firms. So between these two um, responses, there's a relatively unexplored link, which is how entrepreneurial activity by natives might react to immigration. And why entrepreneurship? So entrepreneurship is a relevant margin of adjustment to labor market shocks. And it's also important for job creation, as it has been found that in the literature that um, young and small firms are key in job creation. But however, the impact of immigration and native entrepreneurship is a priori uncertain. In terms of economic theory, the effect can be either positive or negative, and hence this remains an empirical question. So what I do in this paper is to ask this question, uh, which is what is the impact of immigration on native entrepreneurship and what drives this effect? So in order to um, answer to this question, I will use a unique setting in Spain from 1999 to 2008. And this setting is unique because of two reasons. First, during these years, Spain experienced one of the largest immigration flows amongst OECD countries in the post-war period. And second, we have rich administrative data, both on population uh, to track immigration, but also worker histories, including both uh, wage work and entrepreneurship. So in this case, entrepreneurs here are proxied by self-employed individuals, and I will be for the separating between incorporated self-employed and incorporated self-employed. So the former incorporated are um, usually proxied in the literature as high uh, quality entrepreneurs, while incorporated are low quality entrepreneurs, but we'll see more on this later on. And then um, the fact that I have this data on both periods uh, when people are employees, but also when they are entrepreneurs, is an opportunity to understand flows to and from entrepreneurship, which in previous literature has been mostly done using survey data. All right, so the approach of this paper is first to establish uh, the empirical results, the, um, the effects um, of immigration and entrepreneurship. So uh, in this case, the empirical strategy that I use is to exploit variation of the immigrant shock across local industries, which are defined um, using a classification of five industries. So industries are uh, grouped into five groups of industries and 50 provinces with a total of 250 observations from 1999 to 2008. Obviously, the location choices of immigrants are endogenous. So in order to um, alleviate the concerns of selection bias, I use a migrant networks instrument pioneered by Anton Gernkart. And in this case, I modify it by including country of origin comparative advantage across industries to um, allocate these immigrants, not only across provinces, as is typically done in the spatial correlation approach, but also across industries. And second, I will be um, providing a quite simple model in order to rationalize empirical findings that combines occupational choice and migration. And I will be estimating the parameters of this model using baseline data and then performing a counterfactual simulation within this model of the immigration increase that happened in Spain during this period. And this will be done in order to, um, well, first of all, explore the mechanisms that are behind these uh, increase, spoiler alert, in the, in the number of entrepreneurs and to align the role of uh, the mechanism that um, I will be arguing is the most likely to be in play, both by the empirical results and also in the model, which is a decrease in labor costs due to immigration. So in terms of the preview of the main results, um, so these are, these are actually the empirical results. So I find the following. First of all, when it comes to the labor market impact of migration, I find that uh, an increase in exposure from the 25th to the 75th percentile of, uh, to the immigration shock from 1999 to 2008 increases by 3% the number of entrepreneurs with respect to baseline employment in, in, a, in a given local industry. And at the same time, I find a non-significant employment effect which is uh, driven by the fact that there's a non-significant wage worker effect and a small and positive wage effect. However, this is small positive wage effect sometimes um, in some of the robustness check is, um, is quite small and non not statistically different from zero. Then I, I perform heterogeneity 
uh, analysis on these three percent um, entrepreneurs. So I find that most of the increase is explained, uh, well, in terms of gender and in terms of education, that's the heterogeneity analysis that I do. And I find that most of the increase is explained in terms of gender by males and in terms of education by highly educated individuals. And finally, I try to understand how are these new entrepreneurs, because this can be either, um, the effect can be either on the increase of new entrepreneurs or a decrease in seizing entrepreneurs. So people that have, people might be abandoning entrepreneurship less so in places where there are more immigrants. So I find that most of the effect of the growth in entrepreneurship is driven by flows, by inflows, and in particular flows from wage work to entrepreneurship. That is people who are wage workers in 1999, but entrepreneurs in 2008. And moreover, since I observe these people at baseline and these uh, as wage workers, I have some information about them and I can understand what type of uh, entrepreneurs are these new entrepreneurs coming from wage work. So I find that uh, more than 70% of these new entrepreneurs were previously wage workers on the top half of the wage distribution and also in medium to high occupations. Gabriel, just one question. Uh, do yes. you observe the, the salaries or labor income of entrepreneurs in the data? I think not. So not for all years. It's recently been called to my attention that I could do it from 2000 and five onwards and imperfectly so so that's something that i have not explored yet because it might be also good to see that margin of adjustment in in this case because you're taking like high skill wage workers to mm -hmm. entrepreneurship so what might be going on with those salaries and also i was expecting seeing some negative wage effects given that most of the people that left the wage employment were high skill, high wage workers. Hmm. Yeah, so I will not show this today, but in some subgroups, I find that there's actually, uh, well, th there's different wage effects. So for males, there's positive, for females, there's negative wage effects, but I don't find the composition effect by which um, the fact that there's high skill uh, native become entrepreneurs makes the wage of high skill uh, well, people who stay uh, wage workers decrease or anything uh, on mm -hmm. these lines. Yeah, because at the end, I was thinking like averages within industries region. No, if you take from an industry region high skill wage, high wage workers. Yeah. Mechanically, maybe those wages might decrease. That that's just my 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 hypothesis. But we can we can discuss it yeah. later. Yeah. No worries. Thank you. Okay. So when it comes to the contributions. Uh, I contribute first to the big literature on the effects of immigration on native labor market outcomes by providing this um, idea of entrepreneurship as a margin of adjustment to immigration shocks, which has been relatively less explored. And then I contribute to this literature on entrepreneurship, particularly thinking about uh, the determinants of entrepreneurship. So thinking about this as an occupational choice. And here I am the first to offer a detailed characterization using administrative longitudinal data as well of the effect of an immigration induced labor supply shock on this choice of becoming an entrepreneur. And finally, I will be arguing that um, immigration lowers the opportunity cost of becoming an entrepreneur by the fact that immigrants provide relatively cheaper labor. Okay, so this is in the terms of contributions. This is um, this penalizes introduction, and now I will go directly to the paper. So first of all, the immigration episode. So here I have plotted the immigrant share of population um, from 1999 to 2015 for, uh, for a bunch of countries and the world. So what you can see is that Spain passed from having an immigrant share of population below the world average in the early 90s to being quite above the world average and even above some other immigrant intensive countries like the UK in 2010. And it also, the immigration share at uh, the end of the period was quite close to the to um, the United States and Germany, which are countries that are quite heavily studied in the immigration literature. So this is a quite large shock. But also in order to understand the impacts of the shock, we have to understand who are these immigrants. So when we compare immigrants to um, natives, we see that they are younger, they are relatively less educated, while they have a lower education attainment, they are overrepresented in manual occupations and temporary contracts. They also earn lower wages and, they and the share of entrepreneurs amongst immigrants is also smaller. Then um, 
it's important to note that a lot of immigrants during this period worked informally. Part of this was because uh, of lack of a documented status. Part of it uh, was also because they might have documented status, but might only be able to work informally. And then even if their education levels were slightly below those of natives, they were subject to substantial occupational downgrading by which they worked in jobs for which immigrants were overqualified. So this is for the immigrants. When it comes to uh, entrepreneurs, um, native entrepreneurs, the number of native entrepreneurs increased both in absolute and relative numbers during this period. And it's also important to note that during this period, the macroeconomic context was quite good uh, with uh, an average yearly GDP growth of 3.5%. So the data that I will be using to conduct the analysis, well, the main two sources of data are these um, micro administrative data sets. The first one is the Muestra Continua de Vidas Laborales, which is administrative social security data with working lives of about 4% sample of individuals enrolled in the social security. I will be observing around 700,000 individuals. And as I mentioned in the introduction, this includes information on self-employed individuals, which are my measure of entrepreneurs. And I will be focusing on people born between 1954 and 1979. So these cohorts are roughly the baby boom. These years, this, between these two years, um, natality rates in Spain were the highest, fertility rates were the highest during these two years. So they represent the majority of people during this people during this period that were in the labor market. And also they were mostly in their prime years. So they are arguably the more affected by the immigration shock. That's gonna be a, that data. I'm gonna aggregate it at the local industry level. And then uh, to understand how the, uh, the number of immigrants varies across different locations and industries, I will be using the Padron Continuo, which is administrative uh, population registry data with information on everybody living in Spain at the beginning of each year. And importantly for my purposes, and in order to um, uh, characterize the immigration shock as well as possible, it includes undocumented immigrants as they have incentive to register as living in a, in a, in a, well, in a given dwelling at the beginning of each year due to the fact that um, in order to access to public um, services they need to um, register. Okay, good. So that's for the data and now the empirical strategy. So I will be using long differences, looking at the change between 2008 and 1999. And in particular, my outcome is gonna be the change in outcomes in a given local industry uh, defined by uh, industry I and province P um, for natives in the outcomes between 2008 and 1999. Uh, normalized by the number of employed people, natives, in the province in 1999. And that I will, I will be using different um, outcomes for the Y. And for the explanatory variable, I will be looking at the change in the number of immigrants uh, in a given local industry from 2008 to 1999, divided by the working age population in the province in 1999 as well. Additionally, I will include some baseline covariates uh, in 1999, as well as province and industry fixed effects. So here you have listed the baseline controls. And then the province fixed effects here are quite important because this will, uh, by including these province fixed effects, they will um, prevent the coefficient from capturing this demand driven response to immigrant consumption, these general equilibrium effects that might arise due to immigrants' uh, consumption patterns. So I will be focusing more specifically on the labor supply shock. As you might know, this uh, quantity here is bound to be quite endogenous. So immigrants are not located randomly across the territory. So I will be using a modified, well, this modified immigrant networks instrument, which is the typical immigrant networks instrument using uh, immigrant networks in 1991. But also I'll be using the baseline distribution of workers across industries for each origin country in order to allocate um, these immigrants across provinces in industries. So just to go a little bit on that, my variable of interest is this one, okay? I just uh, listed here again to, for reference. So in particular, this number of immigrants, this is calculated from the Padron Continuo, but there's no data on industry there. So what I do is I take the immigrant worker share in province P at time T and industry I from the labor force survey, and I multiply it by the number of immigrants in province P at time T. Um, so if all immigrants were working, this will not be a proxy. This will be the actual measure. Since not all immigrants living in a province will be working, this is a proxy. That's why um, 
it, I call this a uh, immigrant exposure IV. And in order to uh, instrument this, I will be um, constructing a proxy of these quantities, okay, this number of immigrants in each um, industry, province, and time as follows. I will sum across countries the proportion of, well, the number I uh, will be allocating the number of immigrants from each country in each year using first the baseline share in 1991 across countries and of across countries. And then this share will be um, for each province over the total number of immigrants from that origin country in 1991. So that will allocate the immigrants across provinces, but to allocate them across industries, I will additionally multiply by the share of immigrants from a given county C in region R. So the level of aggregation is a little bit uh, more sparse due to the fact that this comes from the labor force survey um, across different industries in 1999. So once I have this, I will sum up across countries and this will give me a, an estimate according to baseline distribution of immigrants. And baseline distribution across industries of immigrants by a country of origin for each uh, industry, uh, province, and time team. So the instrumental variable will just uh, be mimicking this quantity here, but with the predicted quantities by, the, by this um, instrument. So basically they change from 2008 and 1999 divided by the predicted working age population in 1999. Well, predicted for the case of immigrants, I will use the actual one for natives. So, um, well, now I'm gonna um, discuss a little bit the, the strength and the exclusion restriction for this instrument. So when it comes to strength, here I just uh, provide um, the instrument on the actual realized value of the immigration shock. And as you can see, as I include controls and industry province fixed effects, the relation remains significant. And eventually the first stage F statistic of the excluded instrument which in this case is just only this one, it's 23.11. So it seems to be strong enough. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go through the exclusion and to the assumption of identification assumption of um, exclusionity now. So when it comes to exclusionity, um, we'll have to assume um, that local industries with higher exposure to shift as distributed by these shares, uh, these shares, I mean the shares at, uh, in 1991, but also, across um, industries in 1999 um, do not have systematically different potential outcomes than those local industries with lower exposure to shifts, conditional on both fixed effects and controls. So one way to provide um, supporting evidence for this assumption is to look at the conditional exigenity of the instrument. This is just uh, the reduced form regression. So I have the instrument on the right-hand side and then on the left-hand side outcomes prior to the shock, which should not be affected by the instrument. And here I report them. Okay, so these are the ones in red. So you can see that change in employment, wage workers, entrepreneurs, and wages prior to the shock are not uh, associated with the instrument. So the confidence intervals, all of them include the zero and are statistically indistinguishable from zero. Well, and then in order to see that, um, well, the instrument is actually correlated with outcomes in the study period, I provide them here, okay? So this is um, the reduced form coefficients that then you will have to divide by the first stage to obtain the actual results that I'll show you later. So in this case, as I told you, there's a no employment effect, which is given by the wage worker effect, but there's an increase in the number of entrepreneurs. And importantly, I also checked that this coefficient here and this coefficient here are statistically different. So I can claim uh, this conditional exogeneity. And finally, I find um, an effect on wages, although, um, now we'll see in the results, there's a positive uh, effect, but small. Okay, so that's for the instrument and the empirical strategy. And now I'll jump to the results. So let me check the time. Okay, everything's good so far. So when it comes to the main results, as I told you, um, I find that the immigration shock has no effect on overall employment, which is partially driven by the fact that there's a decrease in the number of wage workers, uh, which is non-significant but I find a significant increase in the number of entrepreneurs. So this is the main result. And then when I look at um, the contribution by an incorporated and incorporated entrepreneurs, I find that most of this is driven by incorporated entrepreneurs, which in previous literature is argued that these are um, more um, successful entrepreneurs, let's say. 
And finally, for the wages, this is the wages of wage workers only. I don't include here wages of or earnings of entrepreneurs. There's this positive effect, which um, is not that robust across um, robustness checks. So it's positive, but in sometimes it's not uh, statistically significant. So here, the interpretation of this coefficient will be that a one percentage point increase in the immigration shock increases um, the number of entrepreneurs as in a local industry as uh, normalized by the uh, yeah the employed population at baseline in the province by 0 0.23 percentage points. This is quite a mouthful, as you might uh, have noted. So I do a back of envelope calculation in order to put this in a in a more intuitive uh, way. So basically, what I find is that the difference between the 75th and the 25th percentiles of exposure to the shock increases the number of native entrepreneurs by 3% with respect to baseline native employment in a local industry. So a positive effect. So these are the main results from estimation. And now a little bit of interpretation in order to see- uh, Gabriel, Yes? Are the coefficients on wage workers and entrepreneurs directly comparable? Wage workers and entrepreneurs. Like two and three? Uh, yeah, so these so are is... normalized by the same quantity. Okay, so, oh yeah, okay. Thanks. No worries. Okay, so with the results, these results are consistent with previous research that finds that immigration does not displace native workers nor lowers native wages, although this might differ um, across subgroups, but overall, um, it's consistent with previous literature, providing thus validation of the research design. And this suggests that immigrants and natives are not perfect substitutes. And well, entrepreneurship increases driven by incorporated individuals, which as I told you is a proxy of high quality entrepreneurs. And just to give you a grasp of, um, uh, in terms of the mechanism that I will be discussing is decreasing labor costs, but for not that you need to hire uh, people, right? So this provides further validation, well, further validation, um, this goes in favor of the of the decrease in labor costs that I will be arguing later because 66% of incorporated firms having uh, employees versus 33% for non-incorporated firms. That's data for 2018 Spain. And finally, in order to understand a little bit what drives this relationship, I will perform heterogeneity analysis. So I do heterogeneity by education and gender. Uh, first of all, and then I look at the flows across labor market states. So basically people who were entrepreneurs in 1999 and wage workers in 2008, the other way around, and also for non-employed individuals. And here I will find that most of the effect is driven actually by inflows from wage work to entrepreneurship. So I'm gonna look at these inflows also in terms of baseline occupation and wages. So occupation here in this data is a measure of skill. So, Gabriel, one, one yeah. quick question. Yeah. Um, in terms of self-employed, you can see characteristics of the firm if they eventually evolve to how many workers they have or any characteristic, or you just saw them as self-employed without any characteristics of the firm? Yeah, so this is individual level data, and I see that they contribute to um, a specific um, times of the social security so I, I have only data on the on the individuals, but not on the firms. So only yeah. extensive margin. Measures. Yeah, and, and because you don't have the rest of the individuals, you cannot see if anyone else is working with that firm or with that self-employed. Because it's a 4% sample. Yeah, so okay. th that's one of the main limitations of this. Yeah, because it would be very interesting to see how they evolve these new entrepreneurs, if they are growing over time or is just something... Uh, of a shock and then they eventually they come back when labor markets adjust and the labor cost gets uh, to the initial value but then yeah it's something you cannot answer yeah i mean i can't be creative with other measures like whether they survive afterwards during the great recession but for now um i just focus on the extensive margin of whether they become entrepreneurs or not can you check, I don't know how prevalent it is in Spain, but whether they are fake entrepreneurs who just work for one firm as, as an employee? So during this period, it was not that prevalent. Uh, this used to be, this started to be more prevalent later on, especially. Like um, starting in 2000, in the 2000, early 2010s. 
Okay. So I will not go in deep into the gender and education analysis, but the motivation is that um, lower educated individuals might be more substitutable in the labor market with respect to um, immigrants. And women are also more exposed to immigrant intensive occupations and they have lower job tenures and they are more uh, exposed also to immigrants. So what I find is that when it comes to entrepreneurship, the effect is disproportionately driven by highly educated individuals and also entrepreneurship effect is disproportionately driven by males. So this suggests that the people who are more substitutable in the labor market with respect to immigrants are not necessarily those that are becoming entrepreneurs. And finally, I will go a little bit more in depth in the flows. So I will first show that the effect is driven by inflows, and then I will look at the composition in terms of inland wages and occupation. So these are the next tables. So here I decompose these um, increase in the number of entrepreneurs into inflows and outflows. And you can see quite clearly that most of the effect is driven by inflows from wage work. So people who were wage workers in 1999 uh, and became entrepreneurs, uh, well, were entrepreneurs by 2008. So these are the ones who drive most of the effect. So now I'm just gonna focus on these ones, okay? On, the, on these inflows and decompose them further to see uh, what type of wage workers were becoming entrepreneurs. So in particular, this is by earnings quartile. So here I have each earning quartile. And what I find is that most of the effect on these transitions, on these flows to wage work is given by people who were on the two top quartiles. So in the, uh, bottom, uh, in the top half of the income distribution. And then I do a similar analysis in terms of baseline skills. Um, so these are occupations, which as I told you is a measure of skill. So I divide it between low skill, medium skill and high skill. And also here, what I find is that most of the new entrepreneurs are people who are in middle and high skill occupations. So these are driven most of the shock. So with all these results, the main takeaway from the empirical analysis is that entrepreneurship increases uh, across genders and education levels, but less substitutable natives are disproportionately becoming entrepreneurs. So, um, that's what I get from the gender and education analysis. And then also I see that more able individuals proxied by baseline wages and occupations are more likely to become entrepreneurs. That's if we believe that people who are more able as, as workers might be better entrepreneurs, which is a claim by previous literature. So here, um, all of this leads me to the following hypothesis, which is that cheaper immigrant labor allow wage workers who are relatively more talented to become entrepreneurs. And in order to um, explore this mechanism, I will propose a model that captures this. And this is just a simple Lucas 1978 model with um, immigration and also two skill levels. So another paper that uh, puts two skill levels into the Lucas model is Hakamon Kleiner, which um, um, is quite close to mine uh, in terms of modeling. So let's just discuss this. Okay, so in this model, I have two types of patients, natives and immigrants. Immigrants only work, but natives can choose whether to become entrepreneurs or wage workers depending on the value of each choice. So they will go to the choice, well, they, they will choose to be wage worker entrepreneurs depending on which pays more. So in terms of um, wage work, uh, the, the value that the choice has is the wage. And the wage uh, is this WJN where J can be high or low. So there will be some workers that are high skilled when they are wage workers and some others that are low skilled when they are wage workers. When they are entrepreneurs, they have an ability Z, okay? And this ability Z determines the profits, well, the profits, the, it determines the profits that they make and these profits depend on their production, which is this Z multiplied by their production minus uh, the wages that they pay. So this is the, 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 the firm production and these are the labor costs. So the production function of each firm is the following. This is quite standard in the immigration literature. It's a typical CS with high-skilled workers. The high-skilled are only natives and the low-skilled workers here. So I assume that immigrants and low-skilled workers are imperfect substitutes in the low-skilled uh, nest with a, elasticity, well, with a parameter of substitution gamma. And then uh, low-skilled workers and high-skilled workers are also imperfect substitutes with an elasticity of substitute, oh, well, with a elasticity parameter rho. And finally, um, I have a decreasing returns to, uh, to a scale alpha, 
which I assume is smaller than one, as is typical in these limited span of control models. And finally, I will assume that this um, entrepreneurial uh, ability is um, distributed um, according to this um, PDFF, which might vary across um, skill levels. And eventually, when we put all of this together, uh, I just hear some black no background noise, so I don't know if there's maybe a question. No. Okay, great. So the equilibrium in this model is going to be some wage rates for each um, type of patient and a location of patients such that taking wages as given, native choose optimally between employment and entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs demand inputs optimally, and labor market clear. So in order to reach this equilibrium, uh, we need two conditions. The first one is optimal occupation choice, by which there exists a cutoff ZH and ZL, such that uh, for this cutoff, the profit is equal to the wage of high-skilled workers and similarly for low-skilled workers. So basically these cutoffs, they define um, the, the ability cutoff for which all work, all individuals above this cutoff will become entrepreneurs and all individuals below will become wage workers for each skill level. And then labor market clearing. This is that eventually the number of people who are high skill, low skill, and immigrants. And in the case of the first two, this is endogenous. The number of people that will be wage workers in each of these categories is going to be equal to the demand by firms of each of these factors. So the condition is this one. Okay, and this, um, this is equal for each J, equal to high skill, native, low skill, native, and immigrants. And finally, what I do with this model, uh, okay, no, so I went too fast. So in, what happens in this model basically is that when immigrants come, they might, they compete with uh, low skill natives and they are uh, complements with uh, high skill natives. So, depending on what type of native you are, you might be affected differently. So I'll be looking at the case of the high skilled native just to build a little bit of intuition. So this is the payoff that you might get from either work, wage work or entrepreneurship. Uh, and this depends on if you're an entrepreneur on these um, uh, profits given by Z. And then the wage work and the, the wage uh, if you're a high skilled native is, and when an there's an immigration shock, what happens is that the wage of natives increase a little bit, but also the profits, the potential profits increase. And depending on the magnitude of these two, then the cutoff ZH might differ. So in the case in which uh, wages are affected proportionally less than potential profits, there will be a decrease on the cutoff, and hence there will be um, more entrepreneurs in this case of high skill um, in the case of high skill natives. So this is the simple image of what is happening, but of course, um, when we estimate the model, it gets a little bit uh, more convoluted. So, so in order- Gabriel, yeah, you have five minutes left. Five minutes. Okay, great. So what I do is I calibrate this model using a simple two-step uh, simulated minimum distance estimator. And the first step is just to uh, set some parameters. So the alpha equal to 0 0.9. So I have a profit share of income of 10% and the immigrant share to its baseline value in 1999. And then the low skill share to 50%. Then I assume that the distributions of ability are the same, but this is, this is still work on progress. So I'm working on relaxing this assumption. And then I estimate the remaining parameters by minimizing the distance between data moments calculated at baseline and the moment simulated by the model. And then this gives me a set of um, estimated parameters. And I use this model uh, in order to simulate the immigration increase in Spain during these years. So what I find is the following. I have the graphs there, but um, in order to, um, to be more um, time efficient, I will just describe what happens here. So I will find that immigrant wages decrease quite substantially. Wages of low skilled workers decrease, but less so than immigrant wages and wages of natives increase a little bit uh, of high skill natives. Then what I will find is that there's a positive native entrepreneurship increase for both high skill and low skill workers. And also this is gonna be driven by average labor costs decrease. This mechanism will be present for both high skill and low skill workers, but for low skill workers, I will have also the fact that 
uh, their wages decrease, which will also increase entrepreneurship. So here I have a discussion of the different data and moments, but since I'm a little bit short on time, I will just say that the, the model replicates the data moments quite well, although there's, um, there's um, a small underestimation of the native entrepreneurship share of low skill and uh, our estimation of the native entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship share for high skill. And yeah, then for relative wages, it's quite close. And finally, I want to draw your attention to these two parameters here. So these are the substitution parameters. And I find that these two, the estimated value are quite close to the literature. I discussed that more on the paper, but this is just further validation that it seems that and the model is um, doing a good job. And here I have just the graph that I commented you about, about what is the effect on native wages and native entrepreneurship. But in the end, what I want you to have in the end as main takeaway from this exercise is that there's this decrease in the average wage bill per worker. So this is the average cost of, um, of each firm. And this is part of the main mechanism that I have in mind, that there's this increase in immigrants that work on low wage jobs, low skill jobs, and they provide cheaper labor. And this allows natives to um, have a lower opportunity cost of entrepreneurship and be entering uh, entrepreneurship more. So basically people, natives that are wage workers, um, basically will not have entered entrepreneurship in absence of the shock. But since there's a shock, there's this decrease in labor cost that allows them to enter entrepreneurship. So the conclusion is this one, that immigration increases native, native entrepreneurship by fostering the entry of new entrepreneurs. The effect is driven by those who are less substitutable and more productive previously as wage workers. And this evidence is consistent with this model that um, basically shows that new entrepreneurs enter due to lower labor costs and competition with immigrants, but only the former for high skilled natives. And then that new entrepreneurs absent immigration shock are wage workers with relatively higher entrepreneurial ability. So this concludes the presentation for today. And this is still a work in progress, especially the model part. I'm still working on it. My plan is to estimate it using um, the identified uh, treatment effects from the, from the empirical part rather than baseline, baseline moments. But in any case, I, I would love to have any feedback. And if we don't have enough time later, you can write to me to this email. And thank you very much for listening to me today. Thank you, Gabriel, for the nice presentation. So now we open the floor for Rim that's going to make the discussion. OK. Should I stop sharing or? Oh, I can stop. OK. I can stop. Can you all see my screen? Uh, I do. OK, perfect. So um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to actually read this paper and for the organizers for their help in organizing everything. Um, so I will start oops, I will start with a very short summary that the paper looks at the effect. Oops, sorry. The paper looks at the effect of immigration on native entrepreneurship uh, in the context of Spain between 1999 and 2008. And interestingly, Spain had a substantial increase in immigration um, where the share of migrants increased from 2% to 14% of the population. And uh, the author uses very rich Spanish social security admin data. Uh, the main findings is that there are no impact, there's no impact of immigration on native employment and wages, but that masks an increase in native entrepreneurship that is driven by incorporated entrepreneurs. And there's a positive effect on inflows to entrepreneurship that is actually driven by flows from wage workers to entrepreneurship. And the main mechanism that is proposed in the paper is that immigrants provide cheap labor, lowering the labor costs, um, and that incentivizes uh, basically entrepreneurship. So the main contribution is that first, the paper contributes to a literature that studies the effect of immigration on native labor market outcomes. Uh, a nice feature of the paper is that it differentiates between wage workers and entrepreneurs. And then it adds into a literature that looks at the determinants of entrepreneurship. And in that regard, it is looking at the effect of a labor supply shock in the forms of migration. 
So I really like this paper. It is a very well-written paper, uh, very transparent and thoughtful uh, analysis. It highlights the important, an important angle of the political debate regarding the effects of immigration. And to do so, it leverages rich and detailed data to explore mechanisms and conduct heterogeneity analysis. It actually relies on panel data uh, that allows tracking, and indiv tracking individual changes over time. And I really appreciated that the conclusion provides a discussion of the external validity of the findings. Uh, it highlights the specific characteristics of this immigration shock and how it may differ from those in other settings, which helps contextualize the results and assess their broader applicability. So um, in general, I find that the paper is a very well executed paper and the identification strategy was very clear. Uh, so all my suggestions uh, moving forward will be related to checks that, uh, Gabrielle, you can do in order to strengthen the conclusions of the paper. Um, to begin with, I thought you should give a little bit more motivation on the advantages of constructing the shift chair IV at the industry at the, and the province level, especially that usually we always see it as a spatial correlation. Uh, I think I understood that you did that uh, because you were motivated by uh, the nature of the immigration shock and how migrants clustered in specific industries. But if you explain that more explicitly in the paper, it will make it clear. Um, the setting exploits exogeneity of the shares, so it's more applicable to the Goldsmith Pinkham uh, and co-authors literature. So I thought more diagnostics could be done just to argue that the identification is cleaner. So for instance, first you can test for pretrans in the periods before the immigration shock. Uh, I know that you already look at the pre-period outcomes, the effect of the IV on the pre-period outcomes, but I thought that you can also separate the industry and province com combinations into high exposed and low exposed, and then plot the raw data on the outcomes of the two, two groups over time. And then you should see parallel trends until the shock starts, you should see uh, almost a gap uh, starting. The second one would be the standard uh, table that they have in the Goldsmith Pinkham paper. So you could compute the Rottenberg weights and then find the sign. And if there are like uh, if the Rottenberg weights were positive, that ensures that the separate chairs are positively correlated with the IV. And then you can find the correlation between the components of the IV and the Rottenberg, the Rottenberg weights and the F statistic with the coefficient. And that would confirm that the variation is actually uh, in the shares. And that's what's driving most of the identifying variation. And then a final check in this uh, for the subject would be to show the top country industry combinations that are receiving the highest weight and thus driving the variation. And then you could test the correlation of these shares specifically with the pre-period outcomes. Um, yes, so next I thought to uh, further argue the robustness, you could control for the pre-period lag changes in the outcomes and check if the results actually hold. Uh, one question that I had in mind throughout reading the paper is that the main sample analysis is built of a panel of yearly individual observations. And then I was wondering if there are people who actually dropped out of the panel uh, or if they migrated out of Spain. Um, and then you can actually also correlate the IV with internal migration flows. So the first point would be international migration. The second one would be, are people actually moving within Spain because of the immigrant uh, because of the immigrant shock? That might not be a lot. Uh, that might not be a problem in your case, just because you are actually tracking an individual in the end. But it would it would tell what's actually happening because of migration. And finally, for a very minor suggestion, is that after reading the literature part and the contribution in the paper, it was not very clear to me what the difference between uh, entrepreneurship and firm production when we know if the owner of the establishment is native or an immigrant. Um, for instance, I thought it is good to elaborate on the contribution of this paper relative to Mahajan 2003, uh, who looks at the native owned establishments in the US. And then the last point is very minor, but uh, I was wondering why you actually mentioned in your paper that Furley and Mayer's paper finds negative effects. Uh, so I was wondering why that would be relative to all the other literature and your paper suggests. And this concludes all my comments. Thank you. 
All right. Thanks a lot uh, for Should the I discussion. stop sharing for other yep. questions? Yeah, that would be good. Gabriel, a quick reply because we have other questions waiting already. You're still muted. So this was a very thoughtful um, um, discussion. So thank you very much. This is really great because, um, you know, I didn't think about some of the things that you have said. So they make a lot of sense and I really should um, do on that. So the only thing I can reply to, I think, is maybe the internal migration and checking um, the, whether people drop or not. So in theory, there might be like practically i mean there might be some people who drop out of the sample and i just classify them as not employed although in terms of natives age uh age um well born between 1954 and 1979 i expect them to to be in spain um if they work there at some point of the period um but yeah i should provide some actual hard evidence on that but yeah, um, that's one limitation that I have. But no, for the rest, um, yeah, I have to um, look at that. But thank you very much. It makes all a lot of sense. Great. OK, then first in the line is Adri. I uh, unmuted you. Um, yes, hi. Uh, thanks for the, for the presentation. It was really nice. I actually have a couple of questions, but I'm just going to ask the one that I wrote on the chat. So the thing is, um, you mentioned you had um, self-employed people as a proxy for your entrepreneurship, but I was wondering whether it holds internally. Uh, the results are internally valid because there might be other people who own small businesses or have just been starting up shop um, before, you know, not related to the, sh the supply shop whatsoever. So do you know anything about that? So I'm not quite sure I understand what you mean, but you mean like what's the effect on existing businesses? Um, no, no, no. So, so what I wanted to ask is uh, you, you had the, um, the self-employed people proxying for entrepreneurs, right? Hmm. But self-employed people could also mean people who are not entrepreneurs because of the supply shock, but independently they've set up shop or, you know, are running small businesses that has not, that have nothing to do with, with the shock so is this result internally valid or did you check for internal validity you know that's the question so one of the ways that i think about this is um well all these self-employed people are people who um start well they run or start businesses and take a financial risk and in the data they are basically the people who um pay pension contributions as self-employed um so they are owners of the business they own and in particular, what my what what they rely on is this distinction between incorporated and unincorporated self-employed. So yeah, I find a, I find a, the fact is driven by incorporated self-employed, which are more high quality entrepreneurs. But of course, um, there might be other um, let's say entrepreneurs or self-employed that are affected that might not be captured in the data due to um, different ways in which they contribute. But I think the, the impact of this is rather minor and the data represents the self-employed people in Spain quite well. So hopefully I hope that um, there's less threats to internal validity uh, given this measure. Right, thanks. All right, next is Morgan. Yes, thank you for the presentation. I have two quick questions. Um, first, I'm wondering about the construction of your IV and especially about the fact that you, I mean, you compute the, 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 the geographic distribution from 1990 or 1991, but the distribution by industry in 1999. And I was wondering whether it could raise some limits uh, with respect to the exogeneity. And okay, so this was the first question. And second, uh, did you did you look at the heterogeneity of the results by industry, and especially if the effect is larger in industries where the number of illegal immigrants is larger? Okay, so for the first one, um, exogeneity of the shares is um, 
is more likely to be satisfied for the 1991 original distribution. For the 1999, I rely on the fact that the immigration share was quite low back then, and the type of immigrants that um, were there in 1999 at the national level, which is at the level I construct the shares, might not necessarily be that related to economic conditions later on. But of course, um, you need to um, have some faith on this um, because that's part of the assumption. Um, but I can think of whether I can do some checks on that. And then for the second, um, the effect, the effect differs across industries. I will say that the industry that sees the larger growth or that drives uh, more of the result is the services. So in this case, I don't observe whether immigrants are legal or not, but I wouldn't, I'm not sure about whether there are more legal or less legal immigrants than in other industries. So that's something that I should check. But in terms of heterogeneity across industries, um, the one that is more affected is the, industry and the other services. So basically like um, restaurants, um, retail shops, all these kind of um, services. Okay, thanks. Great, and Jim? Uh, hello, Gabriel. Um, actually, Morgan just asked my question. So I was also curious about the uneven effects by industry. I think that could be something interesting because the only, only argument you have in terms of mechanism is that you're making the assumption that having more migrants allow, lowers its labor costs and which increases the entrepreneurship. Maybe that's something that you need to dig a bit more. Uh, like, uh, like you can look at then how number of migrants increase in a sector and how it affects whether in those sectors you see a more entrepreneurship. And maybe you can even look at the wages in those sectors, maybe, maybe causally, maybe just descriptively. But I think that could be an interesting avenue, especially given the story you have. And that is the closest you can get to the smoking gun with this data. That would be my thought. I hope you could hear it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I can hear. Okay. No, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense, actually. So yeah, I'll know that and, and get back to you um, when I do some more research on that part. Okay, well, thank you for the suggestion. All right, uh, Ernesto, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Hi, Gabriel. Uh, great presentation. So I was thinking, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you, uh, you study... Um, the first difference, right? Over over what, like 17 years. So I was thinking whether uh, maybe it would be worth trying to get more observations and instead of, of doing a first difference, doing a, a, a fixed effects regression. Because regression. maybe, I mean, I don't know if, if uh, the migration shock at uh, the province level is consistent across time. So maybe if you split your sample, I don't know, in like these are 17 years and like, I don't know, Whatever, eight and eight or something like that, you could um, you could see first um, again you would have more power and, and you could be more precise in in, in your estimates. Um, maybe you you need to modify both your instrument and the general uh, identification strategy a little bit, but um, yeah, that might give you a little bit more more precision and and uh, you know more more detail as well into what's happening. So actually the first uh, draft of the paper, so when I started this project around a year and some months ago, I used to uh, I used a year to year variation and fixed effects at the province and time level. And the issue there, yeah, the results were not that different, but the issue there is that first of all, uh, from year to year, maybe there's not so much effect on entrepreneurship. It takes a little bit more. And second of all, um, people were not convinced so much uh, because there's this um, dynamic source of bias by outlined by Jagger et al, um, the, the immigrant networks IB. So um, yeah, basically they decided to use a long difference specification and sacrifice some power in order to avoid these concerns that there might be some um, dynamic sources of bias. But uh, I mean, I could, potentially look at doing something uh, like a split in two periods, something like that. Because at first, uh, so the three uh, main origins of immigrants are Ecuador, Morocco, and Romania. And the reasons 
why people come from these countries differ over time. So for Ecuador, it was the crisis of the of the late 90s, early 2000s. For Romania, it was more about the joining the European Union. For Morocco, it's been fluctuating a bit. So these are two distinct periods, let's say, for uh, these main origin countries. And maybe there's there's the shocks are not that correlated across these two periods. And I could think about that. So that can I can I could see that if if it works, yeah. But doing year by year, uh, I think that's uh, that's a bit dangerous because people are quite worried about these dynamics or social bias. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, no, I think two periods would be would be probably the way to go. Thank you. Okay, uh, Audrey had another question. Uh, yeah, hi. So the other question that I had was. Um, so you said that the mechanism behind the supply shock causing the entrepreneurial tendencies is the low opportunity cost of the immigrants who are, you know, broadly um, low skilled and inexperienced. But is there a scope to um, look at how the causal effect may change as and when these migrants start integrating and acquiring skills? So definitely that would increase their susceptibility with natives and maybe... Um increase the fact that, so well, the fact, the mechanism by which some natives might become entrepreneurs as a form of self-insurance rather than an opportunity. But for this period, I will say that it's a bit uh, short. So I don't think there's going to be that much integration, but maybe that might be something to um, investigate more in the long term. But any, anyway, I'm just parting from the assumption that there's not so much integration during this period, which might be totally wrong. So I should check that definitely. Right. Yeah, because I, I think that entrepreneurship might then, you know, take a hit or might fall because less and less people, fewer people would move from, right. from their wage work. to. Yeah, that's just a hypothesis. So, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Marielle? Thank you. Hi, Gabriel. Super nice Hi. presentation and work. Congrats. Uh, just a brief comment. It's related to what Morgan and Sam said before uh, in terms of probably migrants shifting industries. Hmm. I think th I'm thinking that maybe you could exploit the 2006 amnesty because, I mean, there is some evidence that that's when some immigrants were allowed to work uh, since, they are, since they were legal. They were probably allowed to work in different industries that were they were not allowed for uh, when they arrived. So I don't know, this is also related to Adrish comment. Maybe you could exploit that as a changing point also in which there are some industry shifting or some, some variation in, in that aspect. But I mean, you, you'd have to check it empirically. So, so that's uh, the Leah's paper, right? The 2000? Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I didn't. Okay, no, that makes a lot of sense. I, I didn't think about how to, um check the mechanism doing that. Okay, no, that's that's good, right? Thank you. <laughs>